You're listening to the Assembly Call IU podcast and postgame show, the place where Indiana fans across the globe hang out online after every IU basketball game. Join us for our live broadcasts on Thursday nights and immediately following every IU game at our website, assemblycall.com. That's assemblycall.com. And welcome, Hoosier fans, to another crushing episode of the Assembly Call as tonight your Indiana Hoosiers fall in Iowa City in overtime to the Iowa Hawkeyes, 76-70. to The Hoosiers now 13-14 and overall, 4-12 and in conference play. And this was a game that was obviously winnable for the Hoosiers. We're going to break down all the reasons why they didn't win. Ultimately, when you miss free throws and you can't make three-pointers, it makes basketball so much harder than it needs to be. And tonight, Indiana played so hard. The effort, the focus, the toughness that we saw in the Purdue game that we hoped would carry over, it did. Indiana had that tonight and turned in a strong defensive effort. But they shot themselves in the foot by being unable to make free throws, 12 of 22, unable to make three, 6 of 27. Uh, and ultimately that cost them, as did some horrible calls down the stretch. And you guys know me. I don't talk about the officiating very much, but there were some calls we down the stretch. We can talk about it tonight. I know. There were some calls down the stretch that were absolutely egregious. Um, and so we're going to talk about all of that. But ultimately it goes in the books as another loss for the Hoosiers in a season where they just can't get anything to go right at the time when it needs to go right. Whether it's a timely shot, a timely call, a timely missed shot from an opponent. This game was just such a microcosm of what's gone wrong for Indiana during the second half of the season. I'm your host, Jared Morris. I'm here with uh, Ryan Phillips, just the two of us tonight, to break it all down for you on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. And let's start the show the way we start every show, and that's with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moment. And the Banner Moment, uh, you know, came late in the second half. Indiana leading 59 to 56. On the previous possession, they had a chance to extend the lead. Juwan Morgan got the ball in the post, missed uh, a really good look. But on the next possession, they came down. Romeo Langford did a good job of being aggressive, driving into the teeth of the defense. Iowa helped. It left Juwan Morgan open for three. And this was, you know, I think some of Juwan's three-point shot selection has not been good recently. This was one you have to take. It's in rhythm. He's wide open. He swished it. It gave Indiana a six-point lead at 62-56. to And, you know, in that moment, it really felt like, hey, we're going to win this game. You know, we're, you know, this team's, effort and the way that they played is going to be rewarded it was a big timely shot by a guy in Juwan who was so off kilter in the first half I mean really just couldn't get himself going really played well in the second half in overtime but of course we know how this one ended and that six point lead Indiana wasn't able to hold on to it but for that moment things obviously looked good and that was Indiana's two best players connecting on a big play to put Indiana up six they just weren't able to hold on ultimately to get the win Today's uh, Hoosier Proud Banner Moment brought to you, as always, by our friends at Hoosier Proud and Home Field. At homefieldapparel.com, you will find the comfiest and most unique licensed IU apparel that is available anywhere. And at hoosierproud.com, you'll find great state of Indiana-themed apparel while sending 10% of your purchase to causes around Indiana, like the Hoosier Veterans Assistance Foundation. Both brands were started by an IU grad, and all Hoosier Proud and Home Field apparel is designed and printed out of Indianapolis. Be sure to check out Home Field's vintage IU designs, including the classic Indiana warm-up script tees and long sleeves, which are printed on incredibly soft tri-blends. And if you like that soft tri-blend material and you like hoodies, uh, then you should definitely check out the Bison hoodie. We've been telling you about it all season long. We all have it. We love it. You should get it, too. Uh, and, of course... Get a brother, get some coupons. You can get coupons. Don't forget to use the promo code ASSEMBLY at checkout for 15% off your order on either site. That's promo code ASSEMBLY at HoosierProud.com and HomeFieldApparel.com. All right, it's time to find, uh, move the ball, find the open man, get some opening thoughts from the rest of our team. That's one man tonight, Ryan Phillips. Ryan, plenty to rant about. What are you going to choose? You know, after the Purdue game, I, I said that Indiana, you look at this season, they just haven't been able to catch a break, whether it's running into a hot shooter or, um, you know, whatever, the ball just not bouncing their way, the, you know, a timely moment, a call not going their way, whatever it is. 
And that was all on display tonight. This was a microcosm of the season. It, it you know, Bohan and, uh, you know, Iowa didn't hit a three in the first half. They hit what, like six in the last couple minutes of the game of Bohan and nails them all. And by the way, that kid, I'd be fine with him getting smacked in the face by somebody at some point this season because he is a trash talker. He's staring down Jawan Morgan at the end of the game. Like, I'm I'm sorry. There's a way to act when you're shooting well. And I would be all in on the dude hat tip the guy. He's making ridiculous shots. But there's a way to act and there's a way to not act. And and that just drove me nuts. Absolutely drove me nuts. Um but, you know, the Indiana, one of the big things they had to do was hold Iowa in check from the three-point line. And for almost the entire game, they did. For about 39 minutes, they held Iowa in check from the three-point line. Bohannon goes off, and you just run into this guy making ridiculous shots. Then you have a bad night at the free-throw line. You get guys you like shooting free-throws at the free-throw line, too. Devontae Green's been pretty good this year from the free-throw line. He went one of four. Uh, Deron Davis had been pretty good lately. He goes two of four. Uh, Juwan Morgan missed a front end of a one and one early. Al Durham, uh, Al Durham, zero for two. He's a guy that you've you've relied on, and they missed him late, and they missed him in key situations. And um, you know, you can't shoot fifty four percent from three the free, the free throw line late. But what I want to talk about, the main thing that drives me nuts, is it drove me nuts tonight. And by the way, kudos to some of the bench guys for really stepping up. We've been hard on them. Evan Fitzner had a fantastic game. Uh, Race Thompson was great off the bench. Um, Jake Forrester even gave some, gave some good minutes. Uh, I really liked what I saw from him. Um, but what drove me nuts is late in the second half. And I was saying this on Twitter. It's just Deron Davis has to get a touch every time down the floor. When he touches the ball on offense, good things happen, whether he's scoring or whether it's just the ball has to go in there. And Deron was working really hard to establish position and he had position and we were not getting him the ball over that last four minutes. He did not get enough touches. And when that guy has, his, has a guy on his back, he's either going to score or get fouled every time, or he's going to find an open man for an open shot. And I think this team, maybe they're just not used to having Deron back, particularly late in games, having him on the floor. And they're not really used to having two post guys on, in, in the game because Justin Smith plays on the perimeter and he's been in uh, with, with Morgan most games. But man, you got to get that guy a touch late. And I'm sure Archie's pushing it because I, I know he's talked about it, but these guys have to look into the post and have to put the ball there. I know Romeo Langford and Jawan Morgan are your top players, but Deron Davis is the guy who makes this team go right now. And he's been fantastic and they need to get him the ball. And, Kudos, by the way, to Duran and Juwan Morgan, two guys we've been really hard on about their fouling. They have been better about playing with foul trouble, and, and they did better tonight, especially in a game that was being called so awfully. And we'll get to, we have to get to that because there were so many just terrible calls. It was and awful. Archie, it was absolutely and, terrible tonight. And and Archie was exploding on the sideline, and he had a right to be completely upset. And by the way, Fran McCaffrey should have been teed up in the first half the way he went after the officials. He was swearing at them. He was in their faces. Big Ten officials have to stand up to guys when they do that, and they didn't. They got Right, it was over. blackout night in Iowa City. The officials all blacked out. So that's. I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous the way this game was called. It was horrific. And Archie Miller, I, if I'm Archie Miller, I'm taking the fine. I'm, I'm saying something about it in the postgame because, you know what, it's, it was legitimately awful. And in certain instances, you could make the argument, Indiana cost themselves this game at the free throw line. That's just 100% true, whatever. But you could make the argument that they need to make that call at the end when Juwan Morgan gets a rebound, gets hammered, and the officials, as, as the clock's running out, as he can't get a shot up because guys are fouling him. It's one thing if it's a loose ball, two guys. He's trying to get a shot up, and he's being ripped to the ground. That's a foul that is preventing him from putting up a shot that could win you the game. That's different than two guys battling over a rebound on a loose ball somewhere or guys bumping into each other. That is, you know, fundamentally preventing Indiana from winning the game or at least having a chance to win the game at the end of regulation. It's not okay that the league's officiating is this bad. It's been this bad forever, and it was horrible tonight. And uh, there's plenty of reasons, plenty of chances IU had to win this game, but that is one just in just stark example right there. Also on Romeo Langford, they called the charge on him late. That ball was out of his hands. That ball should have, that shot should have counted. It should have been a foul after the shot. When they called the charge on Romeo Lake, where he drove in and banked the ball, the ball was long out of his hands before he ran into the Iowa guy. That should have been a basket and the offensive foul going the other way, which the officials can call. And they should have called in that situation because the floater was far out of his hand. 
before he uh, it ran into the defender. So, and then there was a call early in the game where Jawan Morgan got fouled shooting a three and for some reason didn't shoot free throws. I don't know what the ruling was there. If they said it was after the shot or something, but as long as Jawan Morgan's in the air, if he gets touched, that's part of the shot. So I, I don't know what they were calling. I don't know what they were, you know, and the announcers, because Andy Katz and Dave Rebson are terrible at their jobs, didn't even bring that up or mention it. So, uh, yeah, it was just a bad night overall. Let's just, let's that, just that was a very well-rounded that. rant. I <laughs> think you pretty much hit on everything there. All right. Show's so over, guys. The, Later. You know, what I want to hit right now, and, you know, look, you talk about not being able to catch breaks. You know, one of the things that really hurt Indiana in overtime was when Rob Finnessy tweaked his ankle and had to leave. And he didn't play for, I think, the last two and a half minutes or three minutes of overtime. And he, you know, I think this was probably his best game since he's been back from his concussion. Easy. He was he was Easy. terrific tonight. Now, you know, he missed some shots. His sh- his shooting efficiency wasn't great, but his willingness to attack the basket, you know, the, his ability to break the press. He had four steals tonight. By the way, you know, he was hounding Jordan Bohannon a lot tonight, and I think jo- but Jordan Bohannon ended up hitting what five threes, and I think three of those came after Rob Finnessy left the game. And it's not that and it's not did. that Devontae's well, three, defense three of them in the overtime, yeah. Yeah, and it's not that Devontae's defense was terrible, because even on that last one, Devontae was right up on him. But, you know, those shots weren't weren't happening when Rob was out there. And, and you know, again, you know, plus minus an incomplete stat, but tonight it told a compelling story. Indiana was plus ten when Rob was on the court, minus sixteen when Devontae was on the court. And I don't think that's fully accurate on Devontae because he had some nice moments, but when Bohannon hit the three in overtime and it's 71-68, Devontae goes down and jacks up a three of his own. And it's, it's a wasted possession because, as you said, the ball doesn't go into Duran. You don't get it to Romeo. Juwan doesn't get a touch. That's not the shot that you want in that case. And that's not a shot that Rob would have taken in that situation. So that his him not being on the court at the end of overtime really hurt Indiana. Obviously, Jordan Bohannon took advantage of it. On the bright side we are starting to see Rob reemerge. He is so much more comfortable now driving into the basket, absorbing content. He's mixing it up on rebounds. He had seven rebounds tonight. And defensively, some of his instincts, the quick hands are back. And his ball pressure, his ability to stay with good opposing point guards has been really good. So He also hit two threes confidently tonight. He did. He did. And he uh, he had some timely buckets too. I'll get to this in a meaningful moment you might have missed. But there was a stretch in the second half you know, at the beginning of the second half where he just, you know, put his stamp and ended a short little Iowa run. It's the kind of stuff we haven't seen where things snowball. And he was a guy tonight that was really able to step up uh, and and not allow those things to happen. So that really hurt not having him there at the end of overtime. I I, I want to bring up Ray Thompson. That's the first thing I want to talk about tonight. uh, If you don't mind, if you're, if you're, I'm we're well past the first thing. So, (laughs) Uh, well, yeah, no, so uh, I don't have the minutes counter in front of me. He played 11 minutes, had four rebounds. And most of that was in the first half. And I'm sure he gassed himself out. Uh, You know, he's just not in game shape yet, which makes sense given how much time he's missed. He didn't score. And I got a lot of people asking like, well, is he another Zach McRoberts or he's not going to shoot or and he's just going to do these other things? No, he's not. But he's a kid who this is really his first collegiate action. He's going against first team guys for the first time because when he played previously, he was getting in late in games. And you, the hope was you'd play him late in games up through December. And then by January, you could get him in against, you know, first or second team kind of guys. And um, so he hasn't, you know, he's just he's not, you know, comfortable shooting yet he will be he's fine and he will be three offensive rebounds for him four rebounds total he was everywhere he made some mistakes defensively but again he was up against tyler cook you know one of the better uh postmen in the big 10 so that's expected there were some times where they got beat on the backside when it was he and you know fitzner or whoever else in there um you know not your first team uh two post guys but you had to love the effort and energy you saw from Ray Thompson tonight. And that's the kind of player he is. And who he reminded me of was Jawan Morgan when he was a freshman. That's the kind of guy he reminds me of. Is a guy who can come in, mix it up. He's not like a typical center, but he's a bigger guy who can play sort of that inside-out role. He can get out to the perimeter and handle the ball for a second to, to move the ball around. He's an energy guy, but he, he also is very skilled. We just aren't seeing it yet because he's not comfortable yet. That's going to take time. And again, these are the minutes. These are this is eleven minutes. This is the kind of stuff he should have been getting in November and December. But of course, he had the concussion. So, what I would tell people who are watching him for the first time and wondering, like, what kind of player he is, 
watch the effort and energy, but then add in the offensive ability, which he does have. And go back, and if you're really interested, go back and watch his high school film. This is a guy who can score inside and out, can make plays. And, and he's a guy who is vitally important to the future of Indiana basketball. He's been gone all year. And you see his effort and intensity and energy tonight against a good Iowa team. And you realize what we've been missing all year and what could have been for this season with him. Um, you know, especially with the early on in the season with Deron Davis was struggling to stay on the court and all that stuff. You and a guy like Grace Thompson, it changes things. It's it really is about having healthy players and having the good, healthy players who you've recruited available. And and tonight was a perfect example. And hopefully race gets a little more confidence offensively. It could start, you know, going up against guys in the post and things like that and, and, and getting baskets uh, because I think it's something he can't do. And he's a guy who could really help Indiana down the stretch, whether it matters for the NCAA tournament or not. I don't really care right now. I want to see Ray Thompson play and, and really help this team down the stretch. Yep. All right. Coming up as we continue our breakdown of Indiana's loss to Iowa, I'll point out tonight's meaningful moments that you might have missed. And then we will go inside the numbers to highlight the most important statistical notes from the game. You are listening to the Assembly Call. Stick with us. All of that's coming next. You're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. I'm Jared Morris here with Ryan Phillips, and <clears throat> we are breaking down Indiana's six point overtime loss to Iowa tonight. Is, it, is this 12 out of 13 losses now? I've kind of lost count. I think that's where we're at, right? 12 oh, out of 13. Who cares at this point? Uh, you're right. Who, do, who does care? Um, all right, it's time for tonight's meaningful moment that you might have missed. You know, a few important ones that I want to get to. The one that I teased earlier, it was 34-32. And Indiana, you know, one of the big changes tonight is for the first time in I don't know how long, Indiana actually won the first segment of the first half and the second half. Indiana, I think, outscored Iowa uh, combined 23-13 to over the first, uh, you know, at the beginning of each half, which was a nice welcome change because that's something that we haven't seen very much. And in the second half, you know, I when I, we went on that 6-0 run, Iowa goes on a little run of their own. They cut it to 34-32, and it kind of felt like the crowd was getting back into it. And I was really impressed with what Rob did right after that. On the next possession, he aggressively took it to the basket, got fouled, hit both of his free throws. Then on the other end, he forced a steal on Garza, got it up to Romeo, who drove and scored. And boom, right like that, it was 38-32. to And the reason why I thought that was so meaningful is because we've seen Indiana at times, you know, come out, have a nice little, you know, make, you know, get a couple of baskets at the start of a half, but then just kind of go into some offensive doldrums. And when the other team gets going, not have an answer to a run. And tonight, Indiana had that. And it's part of the reason they were able to stay in the game. You know, later on in the second half, there was a big swing. We're up 49-45, about 11 minutes to go. And Rob got a steal, goes coast to coast, but he misses the layup. And it's one that he should have made. He didn't get fouled. He just kind of short-armed it a little bit. And Bohannon went down and hit a deep three-pointer. That was the first three that he had made, and it's 49-48. And again, those are the kind of shots that have kind of allowed the other teams to build momentum. And again, I was impressed with you know our freshmen and their ability to step up and make a big play because Romeo came right down on the other end, made a three. It's 52-48. to And then Rob hit one the next possession. Uh, it, it's 55-50. to And so, you know, those plays tonight were part of the reason why Indiana led for most of the second half, because when Iowa would make a little run, we would step up and make a play. Now, obviously, it didn't last all the way until the end, and we weren't able to do it in overtime, but it was nice to see from those two guys, and especially from Rob, you know, that's what you want from a guy who's going to be the leader of your team and a point guard and the guy who's going to have the ball in his hands. And again, it's it's why his absence in overtime was such a big loss. But it was nice to see us finally in the second halves of games have answers for those kind of backbreaking shots and not allow them to be backbreaking, not allow the other teams to go on these big runs because tonight we actually had some answers for them. Yeah, I know. It was great watching the team answer uh, those runs and, and everything. It's it's just, it's again, I, and and I know because I mean, I can hear people screaming probably in the chat and on Twitter or whatever, oh, you're making excuses, but... Sometimes you do need a bounce every now and then, and they just didn't get when the and this is what like the twentieth game in a row it feels like they couldn't get a single thing to go right, and they they worked so hard to to get to put themselves in a position to win, and then you get a guy making unconscious shots and, and again, hat tip to Bohanna for making those shots. I don't like his attitude when he makes those shots, but hat tip to him for making those shots i mean it's you know 
it, and for pushing off and not getting it called on that one. Yeah, don't get me started. Um, but, but no, hat already, tip to him for making them. I mean, yeah. I mean, truly, well, because it's nice to see some. Because, you know, again, we've talked about on here, there, there can be a difference between playing bad and shooting bad. Sometimes you play bad and you shoot bad. Sometimes you play badly and you shoot well, and it masks the way that you played. Tonight, I thought Indiana played well. But as I said at the start of the show, when you can't make free throws and when you can't hit open threes, you make basketball so much harder than it needs to be. And that's the problem for this team is it feels like they're constantly playing uphill because they don't help themselves at the free throw line and they just can't consistently make open threes. And then and sometimes the way, they take bad ones like Romeo's at the end of regulation <laughs> where he's, he's got to drive in. It, it, we'll get to that. He has to drive in there. But so, it just Indiana played well tonight. They didn't shoot well tonight, and that's an no, important distinction. No, and if you look at the last two games, if 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 they had played the way they have the last two games during this losing streak, this long streak of, of losing, they would have won uh, half the games. They, well, even then, at least you'd feel better about it. Like, I mean, you, you know, you yeah. feel like okay, well, at least like okay, things aren't going their way, but at least the efforts there, the intensity is there. They're trying to figure things out now. Offensively, it looks like they're starting to figure some things out, even against the zone, which against Iowa. The first time they played them, they looked horrible, just looked horrendous against that that zone. They looked much better this week. They actually got them out of the zone. It took them a minute, but they started finding Fitzner at the, at the free throw line. They started finding Race Thompson at the free throw line and moving off of that. And things started to look better. Now, again, they need to feed the ball into the dang post and, and get Deron Davis going. Because if you get Deron Davis going, then everybody else is going to benefit. And I felt like late in the second half, that was where they went wrong, was yep. that you have a guy who is so effective down there. And and Archie you know, can't leave that to chance. I know you said Archie wants them to do it. I mean, that's where you've got to take a timeout and say this has to happen. I agree. Fully agree. And and I think I honestly think on that last possession, Archie, when they had the ball and it was tied after Bohanna makes that three, I think he should have called a timeout and set something up because he left it to, OK, let's clear it out. And let Romeo go one on one. And and look, 99 percent of the time, I'm fine with that. But the way that Iowa was guarding him all night, he was having trouble getting clear driving lanes. And they they switched the big guy onto him. So he figured I can't drive. He'll block my shot. So I'm going to step back and you get that thought process. But our, but Romeo's not a step back three point shooter. And he missed it by about a foot. It's the same and, shot. It's pretty much the same shot he made at the end of the first half against Purdue. But you're not going to make a living making that shot. No, exactly. It's a high degree of difficulty shot. Now, look, and, and then you look at the overtime and look, Indiana had a couple possessions. Devonte pulled up on a three, which is not what we want. Uh, there's just, you know, there were just some bad possessions there and it led to the loss. I mean, it, and of course, Iowa comes down and you guard them well. I mean, look, we've talked about Indiana not guarding three point shooters. Well, that happened against in the first half against Iowa the first time they guarded the three point line really well tonight. Yeah, they they just had a guy hitting covered shots. I mean, again, there is I mean, no they went seven point. of 25. You would take that. You yeah. know, you would take and that coming four in of them, and, and four of those threes were in the last six minutes of the game, including overtime. I mean, y- you know, you just look at this and you say, like, at some point, a break has to go Indiana's way. Right. I mean, at some point, one does. And and when you're guarding a guy perfectly, whether it was Devante, whether it was Rob Finnessy, whether it was Romeo Lank for the end of the half, they had a hand in his face, at least close enough to make it a rushed shot or a contested shot. And he was hitting him. I mean, at that point, you're just standing there. What do we do? What can we do? And there's nothing you can do because that's just bad luck. You ran into a shooter. And, and the problem is, is that it happened at the wrong time. Now, again, you make your free throws. You're not in that position. You make another three or two. You're not in that position. Um, but, it, you know, all night, this team battled and battled and battled and didn't get what it deserved out of this game. Um, you know, I, th- I think it's as simple as that. Uh, you know, you give up 15 offensive rebounds, but. They didn't really give up a whole lot of second chance points. I mean, they defended pretty well throughout the game. Juwan Morgan. Six we gave up top. 20 second chance points. Oh, well, a lot of those were in the second half then, I think, because I think the number was low in the first. I don't know. Yeah, they had, uh, they had 15 offensive rebounds. So yeah. that wasn't perfect, but. No, but, you know, Juwan Morgan, six blocks. He was working hard. Um, and then, you know, when guys work hard and don't get calls, Romeo Langford was fouled on drives a few times, didn't get calls. Uh Jawan Morgan, Deron Davis, battling in the post, battling for rebounds, getting guys up all over their back, getting pushed around, not getting calls. I mean, it's frustrating when you're a player when you can't catch any breaks. It does frustrate the heck out of you, and it's it's frustrating for the. Fans. I thought the guys dealt with the frustration well tonight. They I mean, that, you know, this that's part the, of the thing is they didn't they didn't allow themselves to get down and have any of those big runs, those big droughts, and that's a difference. You know, 
that that this team hadn't shown hasn't shown during this big losing skid they showed more of that mental toughness that it's, god that's why I, I wanted this again same thing as the Purdue game I wanted this so badly for them because they you know they brought the effort they brought the fight they're doing things differently and it just had the same result and they they earned a better result tonight they just didn't get it you know and and, and I know people are going to you know quibble with that yes again they needed to make free throws they needed to make threes they needed to do some of those things but the way they played, they earned a better result tonight, and it just didn't come. And that hasn't been the case in a lot of these losses. They got what they deserved in a lot of these losses. I don't feel that way the last two games. That's part of what yeah. makes it so frustrating. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I, I just think that there were there were opportunities to win this game, certainly. But I also think that as a, as a player, you need some things to go right that are out of your control just to give you the extra boost you need to continue working on you know like i mean they sometimes uh, when a review goes against you it's deflating it is and by the way that ball went off tyler cook's leg i don't know what pretty obvious to me (laughs) it was obvious just the (laughs) physics of it didn't make sense unless it went off his knee and that's you know deflating to be on a team and be like hey no we knocked it off his leg it's out of bounds we're gonna get this ball and you're in that huddle getting ready for offense and then nope they didn't overturn it that's deflating you can say oh be mentally tougher but that's not it's human nature to get deflated by something like that you know i mean when you drive in and you don't think you've committed a charge and you make a layup and they take away the basket that's deflating it really is and and i think that honestly it, there, it, that's when I say, when I say you need some bounces to go your way, that's what I mean. You just need some 50 50 calls every once in a while to go your way because you can't cons- consistently be deflated throughout a game and be expected to rise to the occasion every single time. No one can, not Duke, not Kansas, not North Carolina, not Iowa, not Indiana. Nobody could be expected to just take all of these punches and just keep getting off the mat. And that's what happens to, in a losing season. You just get demoralized. And that's how you get the Minnesota game. I mean, it, it is. You just you're demoralized. You think you're going to lose. And you, there's no excuse for coming out as bad as they did against Minnesota. But that's how that happens. Is yeah. when you constantly get punched and punched and punched and punched, and nothing goes your way, and all of a sudden you look up and you're down thirty on the road against Minnesota. I mean, that is that's how that happens. And um, I don't know. It's just, it, like at this point of the season, I don't know what to do. It's Friday night. It's nine o'clock here. And I have no idea what to say about this season. It's gone in a way none of us ever saw happening. Like, and, you know, and there's some comments. They got what they deserved. They didn't hit free throws. Yes, we said that. You know, as James said, you have to execute down the stretch. They did. And we meant like, yes, there are things that they needed to do better. They needed to make shots. They needed to make free throws. They should have gotten it to Ron. They, you know, you can't give Bohannon any space at all. Like, I acknowledge all of those things. What I'm saying is, some of the things that we've wanted to see during the losing skid that we haven't, we've seen these last two games. And I and the they commenter, still couldn't. And they yes, still didn't you score forty six points at home. You don't deserve to win. I get all of that. And you're right. I'm not saying that like we should petition for the results to change. I understand why we lost, but I'm saying the effort, the togetherness, those things that have been missing, that was there. They earned the win in terms of the effort they put in. They just didn't have enough execution. They didn't have enough shot making. I understand how basketball works, but after <laughs> yeah, we understand you know, the physics of the, yeah, of after this. the previous seven weeks, frankly, it is nice to come on here after two games and be talking just about execution type things. But to see these guys trying different things and pulling together and fighting and clawing and scratching, you know, it, it's nice to feel proud of that because we weren't able to do that for some of these games in the losing skit. So that's what I'm talking about. That's what I mean. Yeah, it's it's an improvement, but it's still a loss. And the thing right, is, and it's still not like, good enough. You feel like if you're improving, you should be rewarded for it, and they're right. not. And and you also worry about, look, we went out, we played our tails off on the road, tough environment, on a Friday night at Iowa, at a ranked team, played our tails off, and still lost because some dude made shots. Like, how deflating and demoralizing is that for a team? These kids, I mean, they, they need a hug. And right because the best player that we had on the floor you know, got hurt for the last three minutes of overtime. Like, I think that changes things. So, you know, I know there's a portion of you that don't want to hear those things, but sorry, like all of this is mixed into this ugly stew of another loss. There are some good things to take from this game. And if you don't want to see that, 
I don't know why you're still watching games, frankly. <laughs> like, just if shut it off and don't watch games anymore what... if you can't find the positives when they're there because we and, know about all the bad things. And for a lot of you guys, I know it's it's no longer about the rest of the season because you think it's over pretty much. And I, I get that. I mean, it, from an NCAA tournament perspective, we can get Andy Bottoms on here to talk about that. I don't think we many... need Andy Bottoms to talk about it I, I mean, anymore. You know, it, but, I, but again, <laughs> like, you know, I don't know w- what they need to do remaining. If they just need to flat out win the Big Ten tournament, I, I don't know that. Uh, but what I will say is, is, so let's say you're focused on next year and you're just like, well, you know, I'm done with this year. I don't want to watch this team play anymore. Be encouraged by the guys who are coming back. Be encouraged by Deron Davis over the last couple of games, how well he has played when he's been on the floor and give him a full offseason to get his body back and to get, you know, up to game shape and all that stuff. Look at what he's doing. He's a guy who's going to be a key part of the team next year. Al Durham, at least defensively, he did not play well offensively tonight, but he missed a couple open shots. Give that guy another offseason, given how what everybody says about how hard Al Durham works. He's coming back next year, and he's going to be a big part of what they do. Well, he Rob, could not get going on offense. we got to talk no, about could, that tonight. He, he could. He, uh, I, I just don't think it's a good matchup for him. I really don't. I don't know why, but I just don't. Why? Like Iowa it. has, like, the worst two-point field goal defense in the league. Yeah, but it he's should not, be. It ha- should be a better matchup for him than this. He hasn't been a great driver lately, though, and I don't know if it's the season. Yeah, but, it, but we can't talk about him like we did for four or five games where he's scoring, and then he come out comes out and have a game has a game like this where he misses two free throws. Has zero I was in points. the middle of making a point, Morris. I'd appreciate you not taking this oh, on. A team. God, that's my job. Must, that must buddy. stink to be that interrupted. Is... <laughs> All right, finish you know, up, and then we'll go to the next uh, segment. Uh, Rob Finnessy coming back next year. Played great and looks like... Look, Rob Finnessy had seven rebounds tonight. Like, I mean, th- that's a dude who fights. And, and you can say what you want about four of 12 from the field, but that kid fights, and he is a, a bulldog when he wants to be. And imagine him with an off, a full offseason getting better. Race Thompson already mentioned him. I thought he played great minutes tonight. And I, and I, I think that you start seeing him, you know, maybe when he catches at the free throw line, making some turnarounds and making those shots. He's going to be a big part of what Indiana does moving forward. Jake Forrester, I thought there was a lot of good energy minutes there. Uh, t- you know, he was 0-2 from the field. He, and one of those shots I wouldn't have taken. I would have kicked it back out. But you know what? There's some energy minutes there uh, and, and look better. Then you look at some of the other guys who were going to be back, and you start getting excited about if Jerome Hunter is back, which everybody I've talked to this week seems to think that they are tilting towards he's going to be fine for next year. Again, we don't know, and the offseason is going to determine a lot for Jerome. But they're talking about him just dominating when he plays. You know, when he whenever he gets on the court, he is fantastic. Uh, get excited about the guys left. If you don't want to watch this team and, and you don't want to get caught up in game to game, just focus on the guys who are going to be back next year. Then when you watch them, and there's a lot to be excited about about that. And especially if you hear Archie Miller talking about, hey, we got to do some things differently. He starts to do things a little bit differently. The last two games have been what you wanted to see from Indiana. They haven't closed the deal. They haven't finished. Uh, but you've started to see like better stuff all around from Indiana. Uh, now they just got to start hitting open shots. They got to start making their free throws. I mean, those are two huge things. Obviously, it's a huge part of the game is making your free throws and not going six of 27 from three and, and being able yeah. to knock some of those down. Yeah, and, and, You see the positives there moving forward. And if you've got to invest in anything for the rest of the season, if you're going to watch the games, invest in that. You know, watch those guys and get excited about those guys. If you've given up on this season, get excited about what's coming back next year because there is a lot of talent that will be back on this roster. Yeah, and in a macro sense, look, another loss is unacceptable. This entire stretch is completely unacceptable. And even with all of the excuses and explanations baked in, this team should have won more games. We we fully acknowledge that. But, you know, there's no use coming on here on a post game and just wallowing in all of the negatives. And frankly, there have been a lot of positives these last two games. So, but we do need to talk about some of the negatives from this game because there were some other ones. And so we're going to get to those here in our next segment coming up on the assembly call. Talk about some of the other decisions uh, from Archie, some that worked, some that didn't. We got to talk more about Al Durham. And I think we need to spend a little bit more time talking about the performances from Romeo, Juwan, and of course, Evan Fitzner. That's coming up on the assembly call. You are listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. Catch us live immediately following every IU basketball game, plus every Thursday night at our website, assemblycall.com. By the way, hat tip to Bob Thompson, our listener Bob Thompson, who made us these new uh, these new songs. I'm really digging these new songs, Ryan. I, uh, 
It's good stuff. Good stuff from Bob. So we appreciate that. What's the name of that one? Uh, that one is called Ricky Rowe, I believe. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he did. No, that, that's Bear's Mouth. I'm sorry. I had it mixed up. That one's called Bear's Mouth. So it's always more meaningful when it comes from a listener. Uh, and by the way, while you're at our website, make sure you sign up for our free IU Hoops email newsletter. Over 6,000 of your fellow IU fans are subscribed. Assemblycall.com. I'm Jared Morris here with Ryan Phillips. We were breaking down Indiana's 76 to 70 loss to Iowa. So let's talk about, you know, the night for Archie Miller. And we've talked about how, you know, something different needed to happen on the final play of regulation when Romeo took the three. We talked about how the ball needed to go into Deron Davis more. You know, and I think there were some stretches there in the first half against the zone where Indiana was really struggling and just really struggling to get the ball in the middle. What turned that around was putting Fitzner in the game. And Fitzner really did a nice job of getting in there in the middle, being ready to shoot. You know, his buckets, you know, were really important. And he, you know, followed that up. You know, he followed that up by playing pretty well, uh, you know, there at the beginning of the second half as well. So that was nice to see. But he I'll was tell you one the, of four from three, and I didn't have a problem with any of his threes. No, uh, and he was confident. You know, he was mm-hmm. he was ready to shoot it. You know, he he came to play, and that's you know it, it's a credit to him too for how just how down and out he has been to be ready when his name was called. That was a that was a mature senior like performance from Fitzner, and I kind of figured we'd get three or four of those from him in Big Ten play. You know, we've kind of only gotten one, so we're not getting as many as I thought. But it was at least nice to see that. You know, and, and I tell you. It, you know, we went into the Purdue game, Ryan, you know, on this theme of drastic changes because Archie had talked about it. And I know some people, you know, everybody has their own definition of what drastic changes are. But we've certainly seen it in terms of the amount of time that Justin Smith is getting. Justin Smith played in the first half tonight. He played six minutes, wasn't particularly good in those six minutes, although he did have maybe the highlight of the game with that follow up dunk with two hands, which was nice to see. Uh, that was a thing of beauty. I do not believe he played in the second half or overtime. He did not he get six, up. He got, what, six minutes? Six he minutes said. total. That was it. And I'm pretty sure they all came in the first half. Two and turnovers. I was okay with it. You know, I didn't, I didn't think he was as bad as he's been at times in the first half, but he also didn't do anything that made it seem like, wow, he's really got to be out there. And so, you know, certainly with him, you see Archie drawing a much stronger boundary where it's like, look, if Ray Thompson's going to go in there and give us good minutes, if Jake Forrester's going to go in there, if Evan Fitzner's going to be able to do better against the zone, I'm going to play those guys. And that was nice to see. You know, and it's possible if we had a little bit more guard depth and if Al Durham looked at all comfortable offensively that Devontae Green wouldn't have played quite as much as he did tonight. But you really just don't have many other many other options if you're if you're really trying to win this game, you kind of had to play Devonte close to as many minutes as you did, especially after Rob Finnessy went out. Um, yeah, and actually, I thought Devonte was fine defensively. I thought he took some really—he, I mean, three out of his five threes were terrible. I, I thought that def- he, he was okay defensively. He yeah, was okay. I thought that for the most part, he was fine defensively. He played I, hard. He just got out of position at times. Yeah, a couple times. Yeah. Um. And 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 look, I, I we're as hard as on Devonte as everybody. I even said at mm. some point. Like We're not as hard on him as everybody. Well, okay. We're, We're pretty, been pretty yeah. Well, of the broadcast people, I would say we're as hard of, on him as, as many people. But I think we've actually uh, been as patient with him as anybody. <laughs> uh, until this season for me. I don't know. Uh, I've been very hard on Justin Smith, though. I think that's fair. Yes. Uh, but but Devontae, you know, he had a, he grabbed a couple of rebounds where I was impressed with his effort. Uh, he moved the ball a bit. But I just, you know, when they went to a press, I just thought, oh, no. Because I just Devonte tries to go, and it's a confidence thing with him. He's very confident in himself, and he tries to cut through defenses all by himself. And and you need to utilize your team. And and honestly, that three in overtime, I almost threw something. I was so mad because a couple times he shot threes tonight. One of them he was wide open. Uh, but he oh, that would have been a big shot too and from the corner. He was wide yeah. open. That was he a just, good one. The problem is Bohannon hits a shot. He didn't like take his time and go through his shot. And and that's what I feel about his shot a lot of times. He just rushes it. He did that on one of his free throws. It's like he just flung it up there. It was weird. And, uh, yeah. And and he you know, it's almost like he tries to shoot with a flourish where he fires it up and pulls his arm back and stuff. And it's just, dude, just shoot a normal three. Stop trying to look good. Like it's I mean, Evan Fister shot and Jordan Hall's shot, not not pretty. They're not the pretty shots in the world, but I'd rather watch those and have them go in you know, then, then look bad. And, um, you know, so that was really disappointing to see him take those shots. I, I really was. And, and the one again in the corner, you're right. It would have been a huge make. 
and he just rushed it. He, he didn't even come down with the ball. It didn't seem like it seemed like he just, it was almost like a volleyball setter, just kind of firing it back up. And you know, that's just, that's the kind of stuff a junior shouldn't be doing. And, and it, it drove me nuts. And, um, so yeah, I think that, you know, him being in as much I, as I, just, does, I can't imagine in his heart of hearts that Archie Miller wants to go down fighting with Devonte green playing 31 minutes, but you know, and you could say, so let's put Johnny Jager in the game or let's play someone else or just, you know, Al struggles be damned. Just, you know, let him run the point when Rob Finnessy can't be out there, you know, of all the options, if you actually wanted to win this game, you probably needed Devonte out there, but my God, the shot selection, you know, after Bohannon hit the one and he took that in overtime, which we've mentioned a few times, you're going to have to live with those. But, you know, think about Indiana. You know, we've talked about how streaky of a shooter Devontae is. When Indiana beat Michigan State, why did they beat Michigan State? Because you got one of Devontae's good shooting games. And yeah. tonight, if you just happen to strike gold and you get one of Devontae's good shooting games, you probably win this one. You didn't. You got one of the 0 for 5 games. And, you know, so you don't get the three-pointers that compensate for the mistakes. And it's a roll of the dice every single time. And today, it didn't, it didn't come out good enough. And I know there are probably a lot of people who wish he had played fewer minutes. I would say I wish that there had been a reasonable option for him to play fewer minutes tonight, but I I don't really see what that option would have been given how the game flow went and given what Al was giving you offensively, which just wasn't enough. And Devontae's defense was good enough. You know, I mean, it wasn't as good as Al's, but it was good enough that you could, you know, it was passable. Even the shots that Bohannon hit, you know, Devontae was still pretty close to him. He got, he got yeah, lost I, on that, one of them, but Bohannon, he was still... Bo, Bohannon, the problem wasn't Bohannon being open. I mean, even on the one he stepped into off the rebound, y- you lose a guy on an offensive rebound where the ball bounces around, and then he ste- He was also shooting it from 25 feet away and nailed it. I mean, it's just... When a guy gets hot like that, there's nothing you can do. You get a hand in his face, you could t- take a wrench and hit him in the knee. He's still going to make the shot. I mean, it's yeah. it's just the way it is. And and I, I I thought that, you know, they defended the three-point line very well. And I was very critical the first time they played Iowa, the way they defended the three-point line, particularly in the first half against them. In, in this game, they were fantastic. Joe Wieskamp, Wieskamp didn't get anything. Didn't get anything. All game, didn't nope. get anything. Um, he did not score in the second half. Yeah, I mean... I, I thought they defended well, and, and and they defended against a very high-powered offensive team. One thing that helped Iowa was they went to the line 25 times. Um, whether you think those are good calls or bad calls, Iowa went to the line 25 times, and and that is where they you know they eat at the line. And they didn't they shot far below their normal percentage. They were 17 to 25 or 68 percent. So there's a door open there if you're IU, and you know you go 12 to 22 and you lose the game. And it's you know again one more three pointer falls in regulation. You hit two or three more free throws in regulation, and this is a I mean, different that's game. the problem. You know, this this yeah. team they got some good looks. They're just they're not able to capitalize on the good looks from three. No, and you Al know, and if, if you go Al- ten of twenty seven from three, that's still not a great percentage, but you win the game. You yeah. know, and they had enough. I mean, looks Al Durham to shoot had Al Durham well. missed. He was over three. Uh, one of those was a late clock force, but two of those three were good looks from three, and they just didn't go in. And and you know, Juwan Morgan shot four threes. All of them were open. And I thought he forced one of them, but all of them were open. He went one of four, you know, and Jawan's a good shooter. And, and I don't think he, he should be shooting the way he, as much as he is from deep right now. But Evan Fitzner, one of four from three, all four were decent looks. And, and he, he Just you know, only make them. I mean, so I have to, I have to mention something. I promise I'm not going to belabor it, but I do have to mention the point. Juwan and Duran sat for a long time in the first half with two fouls. They both finished with three fouls. Just saying. They could have played more in the first half. I continue to game, hate. I, I that's fine, but maybe we could have been up by four. That argument is that is faulty logic. I'm just no, saying you foul is, out your I own players. Is, is lo- you go as long as you can without those guys to save them because the fouls were bad. It's one of the fouls for each of them was a bad call, and you knew what these guys were calling. Yes, I agree with Archie sitting them for the rest of the first half as long no. as you're within a few. Sit points. them down, calm them down, get them back in the ball game. So that you actually have some exactly. offense instead of the minute. Because you're right. Jake and Race did give you some good minutes, but they're not giving you anything on offense. Hey, what did they do best in, in the first half towards the end of the first half? Look, that was Fitzner I, I'm just saying, in there. That was Fitzner in there making yeah, some yeah, plays. Yeah, uh, that's fine. And this is all individually anecdotal. But what I'm saying is you take the guys out to save them. They finished the game with three fouls. They could have played more minutes. That's the point. And I continue yeah, I to hate it. And you continue to shake your head, but you win games by getting your best players on the court for more time. I'm just saying, I, I philosophically I cannot stand sitting guys with two fouls for that long. I just don't yeah, like I, it. 
So I just don't agree in this even instance. if it works out in a particular situation. Yeah, I don't. I don't agree in this instance. So no. there we go. We disagree. Yes, we do disagree. Sorry, buddy. All right. Well, where are we going to go next? <laughs> um, I do. I do want to say. You know, I mentioned this earlier, uh, it, it, and I. You know, part of the reason why it was okay that Juwan sat some in the first half, and I do think it was fine to you know put him on the bench for a little bit, is he was really off kilter early. I mentioned this on the halftime report. You know, he had Jordan Bohannon on him when when Iowa was playing man didn't attack that. I mean, it was in the post. Like, his just recognition offensively wasn't good. Uh, the only two shots that he took in the first half were three-pointers. Only had a couple of rebounds. Just really wasn't getting it done. But I thought he played like a man possessed in the second half. Ends up finishing with 15 points, only five boards, but six blocks and three steals. And th- there are a couple of those blocks you kind of wish you had just gone up and just caught the ball yeah. instead of swatting it all the way. Yeah, instead of swatting it all the way Especially out. Especially that but last he- one on Bohannon where he... Where he- absolutely could yeah. have just caught the ball. But no, but he did such a good job of defending aggressively without fouling in the second half. And he, you know, l- you know, you needed him to rebound from his poor first half and play a strong second half, and he really did, and that was nice to see. And then, you know, in terms of Romeo, I thought, again, just like in the Purdue game, it was far from a perfect offensive performance from him, but man, did he battle. And again, you know, seven rebounds, you know, had a couple of assists. The one that I mentioned to Juwan, you know, he had a few ball handling moments, you know, when he got doubled a couple times, he wasn't strong with the ball at all. Uh, you know, so he did have four turnovers, obviously the offensive foul that we talked about earlier, but he yeah, played 44 four minutes. Turnovers were offensive fouls. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, I do feel like there were some opportunities for him to be aggressive, especially when Iowa was in man. It felt like if he wanted to get it and drive to the basket, he could. And so I, I thought there were sometimes, again, he struggled to kind of pick his spots properly. But in terms of a guy really going out and battling, you know, giving you effort, playing hard, I thought he really played a hard, tough game. Um, and, you know, wasn't as efficient on offense as you would expect. But, you know, still overall a pretty good game from Romeo. Um, yeah, I thought he was guys? fine. I, you know, freshman on the road, and, and he turned in that performance. I'm fine with it. I, I do kind of wish he'd driven more instead of taking six threes. Uh, but again, against As the a zone, commenter noted, noted, I think Romeo's tired of driving and getting clobbered. Yeah, it probably I mean, is, but it probably is because there were a couple times he drove in tonight and got absolutely hammered, got no call. And uh, I thought the first charge was a very bad call when he drove in and dished it off to to Duran. I thought that that was a bad call. I thought the guy slid in late. I thought it should have been a no call. I didn't think it was a block. I thought it should have been a no call. And officials need to do that more often when guys collide. Just don't call a foul. If it's a 50-50 call and nobody gains an advantage by it, don't make the call. Just let it go. These guys, it's a physical game. Basketball is a physical game. And then I thought on the second one, I thought they should have counted the basket on that uh, on that charge. Uh, I thought it was clearly out of his hand plenty before. I thought it was a different motion than the shot when he ran into the guy. And again, that's an official not knowing the rules and and not paying attention and trying to make a flourish call uh, for the home fans. And it you know obviously drives every IU fan nuts for that. So um, you know. Uh, it's just it, it, it's a rough night <laughs> in the Big Ten when when you're not getting those calls and you're a star player. Do you think Fitzner should have played more in the second half? He only played 14 minutes total. Um, I don't I don't know because you had Duran and Juwan yeah. both ready for for that, and I'm not sure you sit either of those guys for Fitzner. I think Fitzner um, did well when he was out there, but I'm not really sure that you, your best game plan is to go away from the other two guys. Um, maybe a little bit, maybe you put them in, in the overtime when things aren't going well and maybe try and stretch the floor a little. Uh, but I, I didn't really see an opportunity to use him, especially given how close it was. And it wasn't exactly chance to sort of experiment with stuff. I think that they, they, I, I had no problem with the substitutions tonight other than, you know, I didn't know that, that Rob had, had hurt his ankle. I was kind of upset that he wasn't in at the end. And then I learned that he hurt his ankle. So, yeah. um, yeah, I, you know, I really didn't have any problems with the way the, the minutes were spread out. Race Thompson, I would have liked to see more, but I imagine he just gassed himself in the first half really. Yeah. And, and, you know, that makes sense. He played 11 minutes. So uh, that's probably his limit right now. By the way, you know, as good as Fitzner played in the first half, there was a play with about a minute to go. We were up 28 to 25 and there was a loose ball and he had his hands on it. And I'd have to go back and watch exactly what happened. You know, the Iowa guy poked it away. It looked, you know, it, it looked like one of those where he should have had it. Like he just wasn't strong enough with the ball. 
And again, 28 25, he gets it. And, and we've, you know, we're going the other way with what looked like it would have been numbers, but he has it ripped away. And that was a play where Wieskamp ended up scoring, hit that little flip shot, and they tied it up 28 28. Yep. That was a big potential moment before halftime, you know, because if Indiana could have gone and gotten a bucket and maybe you lead by two or four points at halftime, you know, that that's, you know, obviously a nice little momentum builder for you uh, at halftime. But some of those little plays like that, when you're not able to get that ball, and so that's where when you get to the end of games like this, where you've got to get 50-50 balls and make those tough plays, that's not necessarily Evan's forte. And they weren't in the zone quite as much um, in the second half. And I think, you know, Duran has proven that he can, you know, he's good at flashing to the middle and passing out of the zone anyway. Um, so I, I didn't really have a problem with it. I, I thought Fitzner got his minutes, did a really good job with it, um, you know, and that was probably as many as he needed, but it was really nice to see. Yeah, well, it was nice to see him play effective minutes. What haven't we hit before we move on to the next segment? I think that's We've covered. pretty much it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure we could cover much more on this game. Uh, it's, just, it's so crushing. It's so it crushing is. to lose another one. Yeah, imagine being in that locker room. No, I know. I mean, they feel it a hundred times worse. That's you know. But it's going to be so interesting to see. You know, can they now come back again for the third straight game and play like this? Because that's the expectation. You know, again, we're, you know, this is the second straight game where we're talking a lot about the effort and the toughness and all of those things because we haven't seen it consistently. We certainly didn't see it Saturday against Minnesota. And so when you go from feeling like, holy crap, this team is checked out to, okay, they're back playing with some of the toughness and effort that we saw earlier in the season. They're just not executing, they're not making shots, and they're not getting any bounces. You know, so you feel a little better about that, but now can they for the third straight game, will they be able to maintain that attitude and focus and togetherness and be able to bring it against Wisconsin at home? They need to. It's got to be the standard. And that's one of the positives that can come from the end of this season if Archie is able to get them to do that. But man, it does feel like at some point they're going to need some bounces. They're going to need to make some shots and make some smarter plays at the end of games to get rewarded. Or, you know, it's hard to just keep coming back game after game after game if you're not getting rewarded for, for all the effort that you're putting in. So kudos to them for doing it for the second game in a row. Now they got to go out and do it again for the third game in a row coming up against Wisconsin. And hopefully they'll be ready to do that. All right, coming up in our final segment, we're going to hand out our game ball, which is probably one of the more challenging game balls we've had to hand out in a while. We'll hit any other storylines we haven't hit yet. Then in last call, we'll deliver our final thoughts on Indiana's loss to Iowa. That's next on the Assembly Call. Stick with us. You're listening to the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. I'm Jared Morris here with Ryan Phillips, and we are wrapping up our breakdown of Indiana's 76 to 70 loss to Iowa tonight in Iowa City. Ryan, I think we can safely make this a short final segment uh, since it's late and since <laughs> there's just not too much else to say after the 12th loss in 13 games. But we do need to hand out game balls. Uh, you know, in a lot of these recent games, it's been pretty easy, but I feel like there's there's kind of a lot of decent choices, no like standout one, uh, you know, in particular that jumps out right off the bat. But who are you giving your game ball to tonight? Uh, I think I'm going to go with Rob Finnessy. Um, yeah. uh, 13 points, seven rebounds, two assists, four steals, uh, just for his complete floor game. For how much he played, he only had one turnover. Uh, I thought he attacked well, hit two threes, which were, I thought, both important. 32 minutes, only one turnover. Yeah, I'm giving it to, to Rob Finnessy. Yeah, okay, I guess maybe an obvious one does jump out because I'm giving it to Fennessey, too. I thought he was the best player on the court. I thought he really, you know, we know that Archie wants to push the pace, and he wants a point guard who's going to really attack. And when he is going to dribble, dribble with purpose. <laughs> That's something that Devontae Green doesn't do. It's something that Al Durham has struggled to do. Rob is much better at doing that. And I thought there were some opportunities where he, you know, of those seven defensive rebounds, when he got the rebound, he turned and looked to push the pace. And sometimes he got all the way to the bucket and would hit a layup. You know, he got fouled. He created for his teammates. And so I thought that was really impressive. And I thought his defense for so much of the night was just really good. And, you know, if you're going to play this style of defense well, you have to be able to pressure ball handlers and you have to be able to create contested three-point looks. The pack line will give up three-point opportunities. The key is they need to be contested. And I thought Rob did a good job of, you know, shutting Bohannon out from getting some opportunities, but also making sure that, you know, that, that three pointers were, uh, you know, were contested. So I think, uh, 
all that was good to see they've from up, him and just ni- updated, nice to see him look like himself again. They've updated it to, oh, wait, let's see. Is it now? Oh, no. Uh, eight assists now for Rob Finnessy? It was seven before. Wait, what? Oh, wait, no, never mind. In the, the game? No, he yeah, only had two assists. The box score just went haywire on me. Okay, now it's back. It says seven rebounds, two assists. Yeah, okay. seven rebounds, two assists. I was like, eight assists? Where'd that come from? Okay, yeah, yeah so the box score went a little haywire. Yeah, seven rebounds, two assists. So, I don't know. What else you got? I think we can probably wrap up pretty soon because it's late and I just don't know what... I don't know. You know, at this point, we've certainly extracted all the positives and I think we've hit on a lot of the key negatives. At the end of the day, it's another loss, you know, and it's another pretty strong defensive performance. There were some better signs on offense, but you have to take that with a grain of salt because I was one of the worst defenses in the league, so that obviously is going to help. And now it's just, okay, what from these last two games now is going to translate to the Wisconsin game? It's going to be you know what certainly me a really different happy? style. What's that? A win? Beating Wisconsin would make me very happy. Yeah. Beating yeah, anybody yeah. would make me happy right now. I don't care who it yeah, is. but Wisconsin specifically. <laughs> let's, let's go for small victories. Let's go for a win over Wisconsin. Let's get that out of the way. Let's, let's, yeah, I want to win over Wisconsin, Jared. That's what I, I want. Too. And a nice late game win where Ethan Happ gets taken off the court because he can't shoot free throws. You thinking about, if you're, if you're thinking about an early present for me for my birthday, six months in advance, let's do it. Let's be, let's be Wisconsin. You really think people are thinking about your birthday that far in advance, huh? They should be <laughs> tough to buy for. You got to think ahead. Uh, all right. Um, so coming up for assembly call, we will do banner Monday on Monday. That Wisconsin game is Tuesday. It's another late start. Um, but we will of course have post game coverage there. So Hooray. yes. So join us for banner Monday and obviously six banner Sunday will be coming out, uh, on Sunday. I um, apologize to everybody, but I will not be on assembly call radio on Thursday because I will be on my way to Indiana. Ah, that's right. Yes. So I do want to mention that if you're listening, uh, we have a room reserved at the Crazy Horse for after the Michigan State game. So we hope that you will all come join us there. We'll probably get there a couple hours after the game because uh, Will DeWitt is going to be back to host the post game show. Chat Mob Chad, who, you, who has been uh, our guest host here a couple of times, they will carry you through the first part of the IU Michigan State post game show. And then when we leave the arena, we'll try to pop on with our phones. Uh, but then if you're going to be in Bloomington, Please come up and say hi or let us know that you're going to be there so we can seek you out. And if you can meet us at Crazy Horse, please come try to do that after the game because we're going to be there hanging out, uh, you know, win or lose. And there will be people there before we get there. So, yeah, yeah. go go back. Yeah, and come just hang out. We'd, we'd love to see you there. It's We do it every year. It's, you know, it's one of our favorite things to do, not only to just go to, to a game, but to be able to meet so many of you. It's part of what makes doing the show such a rewarding experience. Yeah, so. we definitely don't do it to go hang out with each other. We can't stand each other. <laughs> yeah. The chemistry gets real weird when we're in person. It's much better when we're removed by <laughs> by Zoom. You guys are just so awkward. I'm 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 just myself. It's actually guys... that, that's not true. We do have fun in person. We do have um, remember, because you're an assembly call listener, you get 15 percent off your entire order. Who's your proud dot com and homefieldapparel dot com. So if you want officially licensed IU gear, go to homefieldapparel dot com. And if you want one of our assembly call logo t shirts. Or one of Hoosier Proud's unique Indiana-inspired designs, visit HoosierProud.com. On both sites, use the promo code ASSEMBLY at checkout for 15% off your entire order. And that means it's time for last call. Ryan, I know uh, you have something important waiting for you, uh, so you're probably going to make this the quickest last call ever. But try invest a moment here and say something profound and meaningful. God, losing sucks. That's my profound statement. Um... Honestly, I feel bad for these kids. They they played really hard. They they missed their free throws and made their bed in that way. Of course, we know that. Uh, but if you look at the numbers down the line, they did not play a poor game. Uh, they just couldn't hit shots, and and that's the way this season is gone. And it, and it's really a bummer when you can't hit shots, and all of a sudden that guy gets hot late and beats you basically single handedly. You outplay him as a team, or you at least play up to their level as a team, and the guy just gets hot, and, and that happens. That's basketball. Um, but I think that you know even the most a, you know, subjective observer who was way down on, on IU this year would say that they played a really good game on the road against a very good Iowa team and lost. And, it, you know, playing a good game is not enough, but it certainly, we did see some positive developments. Um, but you got to win the game. 
And, and sometimes uh, this team just needs to catch a break. It needs to catch some kind of a break somewhere. And tonight that didn't happen. Jordan Bohannon goes off, is unconscious at the end, is hitting turnaround shots where he's not even looking at the basket. I mean, it's just, you know, there is sometimes things just don't go your way. And tonight was definitely a night where things didn't go Indiana's way. Purdue was a, a night that things just didn't go Indiana's way. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a snowball effect and these things have all been really tough to watch as a fan of this team, especially as the team has started to play better and really focus. Um, so kudos to them for the effort tonight, but it just wasn't enough. And, and hopefully on the home floor, they can, they can take out Wisconsin because, uh, that really would at least give them some kind of positive to come from this change in the way they're playing. Yep. By the way, uh, honorable mention to Juwan Morgan for game ball two with 15 points and six blocks and three steals. As we mentioned, he, uh, he really rebounded well there in the, uh, by rebounded, I don't necessarily mean like grabbed rebounds, but you know, bounced back from his, uh, yeah, go eat. I know. Go, go eat. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Ryan's leaving. Um, you know, really bounced back from his poor first half. I thought to play a strong second half. So kudos to him for that. Yeah, you know, it, at the end of the day, I mean, there are there are positives to extract from these last two performances. And I thought coming out of that Minnesota game, it, you know, it was just really important to see what this team was going to bring in terms of the effort and the togetherness and the communication. And, you know, Archie, you know, talked about drastic changes and while the drastic changes haven't happened in the win column because Indiana just keeps losing and the shooting hasn't gotten better and there are still so many stunted offensive possessions where they just don't look coherent and sometimes they don't even look like they know what they're supposed to be doing not everything has changed but there has been a drastic change certainly from that game and from other games that preceded it in terms of the communication and in terms of how hard these guys are playing and how tough they're playing. And they're not doing enough to create the breaks they need to win these games. And they're not getting enough of the, you know, basketball God smiling on you breaks to win these games. But they've played the last two games, you know, in a way that you can at least be proud of. And, you know, with so many losses and so many losses to not be proud of, that at least counts as progress for this portion of the season. And when we step back and look at this in a macro sense at the end of the year, and even we can do that right now and talk about how unacceptable this stretch has been, and it is, because at some point you got to find a way to win these games. You know, at least in the micro sense of these two games, those are things that we can feel better about. And so, you know, I just hope that the guys are more encouraged than discouraged by the positive results that they've seen, certainly on the defensive end of the floor from what they've done the last two games. And they're able to keep that and carry it forward because, you know, we're still in the early stages of a tenure of a young coach and the, the recent returns on that tenure haven't been good at all. Um, but he is still trying to build and establish his culture for what Indiana basketball is going to look like moving forward. And there's so much from the past 13 games that we would all just like to fold up and pitch away and throw away and never look at again. But if we can at least come out of this knowing that this is going to be a program that's going to fight and scratch and claw and have a defensive identity, you know, then it at least won't all be in vain. And, and, and that's what I was the most afraid of after the Minnesota game is that we would even lose all of that and just fade to the finish with nothing that we could take and build on at least these last two games there's something to take something to build on now we've got to find a way over these last four games to win because all the building blocks don't matter if you never win so these guys just have to find a way to make some shots make some free throws get a bucket when they need it get an extra stop when they need it and just get a win we all need it no one needs it more than those guys but hopefully it comes on Tuesday against Wisconsin and we can continue to slowly but surely build our way out of, you know, the awful play that we saw uh, a week or two ago and finish this season strong with something to believe in. That is uh, about all we have left to hope for now, I suppose, at this point. All right. Well, that'll do it for us on this edition of the Assembly Call IU Post Game Show. If you want to see us do the show live and be part of the live chat, make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash assemblycall. You can also subscribe to our podcast by searching for Assembly Call wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to go to assemblycall.com or text IU to 66866 to join our free email newsletter. Thank you for listening. We'll be back to talk IU hoops again with you on Monday and then Tuesday after IU Wisconsin. Until then, keep your elbows in and your eyes on the rim. Go Hoosiers. 
thank everybody for coming out. All right. I got to get out of here, folks. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for listening to this episode of The Assembly Call. We appreciate it. And we really do rely on the support of audience members like you to keep our show going and to keep growing. And so we have set up a page on our website at assemblycall.com slash support that lists five ways that you can support the Assembly Call. And we encourage you to choose whichever method is the easiest and most convenient for you. One of the methods is donating, and so many of you have donated, and we appreciate it so much. On that page, you can choose a monthly recurring donation or an annual recurring donation or just a one-time donation, whatever works for you. And if you don't want to donate, another way to support the show is you can use our affiliate URLs, iutickets.shop or iustore.shop when you're going to shop for tickets or gear, and we will get paid a small commission when you use those links. But however you support the show, we appreciate it. Thank you.